Father, we thank you and we praise you for the awesome privilege of coming this night and assembling ourselves together in the precious holy name of your son Jesus. And Father, we're being obedient to your word. You said to fail not the assembling of yourselves together. And Lord, we are here. We are assembled together. And Lord, we are come expecting to receive from you this night. And Father, I thank you that your precious Holy Spirit just ministers to each person, just touches each heart, brings change in every life. And Father, I thank you and I praise you in advance for what you will do this night through the Word of God. And Father, I thank you that there is life in your Word, there is health in your Word, there is prosperity in your Word. Everything that we need is found in your Word. And I thank you that we have your Word and we have the precious Holy Spirit who is our teacher. And I thank you that this night the Holy Spirit teaches us this Word in Jesus' name. And we give you thanks and we give you praise. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Well, we have started a new series entitled A Walk Through the Word from Genesis to Revelation. And it is my prayer that through this study you will become more familiar with your Bible. And most of all, I pray that you will fall in love with the Word of God. The Word of God holds the answers to the decisions that you need to make. Every Amen. decision that you're faced with, the answer is found in the Word of God. The Word of God holds the answers for every trial that you face, for every problem that you have. The Word of God will bring the answer and solve that problem. And the Word of God is the answer for every storm that you face in life. And everything that you go through, the Word of God will bring you comfort. The Word of God will bring you help. The Word of God will bring you encouragement. The Word of God will bring you hope. The Word of God will bring you help. The Word of God will bring you life. The Word of God will bring you whatever you need. It is found in the holy, Amen. written Word of God because it's God's love letter to you. Just as God created Adam, so that he could have communion and fellowship with Adam every day. God would come down and walk with Adam in the cool of the day. And just as God created Adam for communion and fellowship, God wants that communion. He wants that fellowship with us. Amen. He wants to talk to us. And how does he talk to us? One way, the primary way, is through the Word of God. When we sit down with this holy book and when we open it up and when we begin to read the words on these pages, God, by his Holy Spirit, will bring that Word to life and will speak that Word into our spirit and cause that Word to just seemingly leap off that page and leap into our spirit and bring life and bring hope to us. And it is my prayer that as we go through the Word, as we go through this study, that you will come to know His Word, but more importantly, you will come to know Him in a deeper and more intimate way. So let's go on this journey of a walk through the pages of God's Word, which is God's love letter to you. And we're going to begin by doing just a quick review of what we covered last week. I know I just bombarded you with a lot of information that most of you had never heard. So we're going to quickly do a review. So look at your handouts. We covered facts about the Bible. The Bible is divided into two parts. And what are they? The Old Testament and the New Testament. And that word testament means a covenant or an agreement. So the Word of God is divided into two parts. The Old Testament or the Old Covenant and the New Testament or the New Covenant. The Bible contains 66 books. 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 books in the New Testament. The Old Testament we learned last week is divided into four parts, four divisions of the Old Testament. And what are they? Law, history, poetry, and the prophets. And of the 39 books of the Old Testament, there are five books of law, 
12 books of history, 5 books of poetry, and 17 books of the prophets. Now, the law, the first division of the Old Testament is the law. The first five books of the Old Testament make up the books of the law. They're also called the Pentateuch. Pentateuch. And that is a Greek term, and it means five volume. The prefix penta means five, like pentagram or pentagon. The pentagon is a building with five sides. So the Pentateuch is five volumes called the law. And the law is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's the books of the law. Now the second division of the Old Testament is history. And there are 12 books that make up the books of history of the Old Testament. And they are, everybody say them together, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Good. Now, the third division of the Old Testament is the books of poetry. And there are five books of poetry in the Old Testament. And they are, everybody say them, Job, Job Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Yes. And then we come to the fourth division of the Old Testament, which is the prophets. And the last 17 books of the Old Testament are the books of of the prophets and the prophets are divided into two groups there are the major prophets and the minor prophets why are they called this because the major prophets have written more material their books are larger than the minor prophets the minor prophets only contain a very few chapters in their books so there are five major prophets and 12 minor prophets. The five major prophets of the Old Testament are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And then the last 12 books of the Old Testament, they are the minor prophets. And they are made up of Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Very good. And that is all of the books of the Old Testament. The years between the close of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament is approximately 400 years. There's approximately 400 year time span between Malachi and Matthew in the New Testament. And these 400 years are known as the silent years. It was a time when God's voice was silent. I want you to turn in your Bible to the book of Amos. Amos is one of the minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, over there close to the end of the Old Testament, the book of Amos. Amos chapter 8. The book of Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. We're talking about these 400 years of silence when God's voice was not heard. In between the old, the ending of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. The book of Amos, chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. The Word of God says, Behold, or look, the days come, saith the Lord God. Who is speaking? The Lord God. And what does he have to say? Behold, look, the days come. They're coming, 
saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but what? Of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. After 400 years of silence, the word of God came, and his name was Jesus. Jesus was the word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. The book of John chapter 1 and verse 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And John chapter 1 verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So what happened? Between the ending of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, 400 years of silence. But then the word of the Lord came. The word of the Lord took upon him self flesh and he came down and dwelt among us. That word dwelt, if you look it up in the Greek, means tabernacled or lived. For 33 and a half years, the Word of God came down from heaven to earth and tabernacled and walked upon this earth. And the events that took place during that time are recorded for us in the Gospels of the New Testament. Amen. Now, turn, lift your hand out over to the, to the back side. And... Let's talk about the books of the New Testament. The New Testament is also divided into four parts, just like the Old Testament was. The Old Testament has four parts. The New Testament has four parts. The four divisions of the New Testament are, let's read them together, Gospels, History, Epistles, and Prophecy. The New Testament contains... 27 books. There are four Gospels, one book of history, 21 books of epistles, and one book of prophecy. And the four Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the book of history, it's made up of one book, the history of the New Testament. It records the history of the early church the beginning of the church age, there's one book of history, and that book is Acts. Acts. That's right. And then the third division of the New Testament is the epistles. And the epistles are letters, and they're divided into two groups, just like the, the minor prophets and the major prophets. The books of the prophets of the Old Testament are divided into two groups, and the epistles in the New Testament are divided into two groups. And they are the Pauline epistles, which are the epistles, are the letters that Paul wrote. And then there are the general epistles. All right. What are the Pauline epistles? They are the letters. They are the epistles written by the apostle Paul. <coughs> And they are, everybody say them, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, yes. And the book of Hebrews, the author of the book of Hebrews is not identified. But most Bible scholars believe that the Apostle Paul also wrote the book of Hebrews. Now let's talk about the general epistles. These are the epistles, or the letters, that were not written by the Apostle Paul. 
And they are James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Jude. And then we come to the fourth division of the New Testament, the book of prophecy. It can, this division contains only one book, and that book is Revelation, the last book in the New Testament. And the Greek title for Revelation is Apocalypse, which means the unveiling or the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation is a prophecy of end time events. It is a prophecy of what is to come. Now, let's continue with our journey of our walk through the Word. What exactly is the Bible anyway? What is that book that you are holding in your lap? I want to read you something. It's entitled, A Tribute to the Bible, and the author is unknown. The Bible is not an amulet, a charm, a fetish, or a book that will work wonders by its very presence. It is a book that will work wonders in every life, here and hereafter, if acted upon and obeyed in faith and sincerity. It is God's inspired revelation of the origin and destiny of all things, written in the simplest human language possible, so that the most unlearned can understand and obey its teachings. It is self-interpreting and covers every subject of human knowledge and need, now and forever. As a literary composition, the book is the most remarkable book ever made. It is a divine library of 66 books, some of considerable size and others no larger than a tract. These books include various forms of literature, history, biography, poetry, proverbial sayings, hymns, letters, directions for elaborate ritualistic worship, laws, parables, riddles, allegories, prophecy, drama, and others. They embrace all manner of literary styles in human expression. It is the book that reveals the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. <laughs> its doctrines are holy, its precepts binding, its history is true, and its decisions immutable. Read it and be wise. Believe it and be safe. Practice it and be holy. The Bible contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's character. Here heaven is open and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subjects. Our good is its design, and the glory of God its end. Mm -hmm. It should fill your memory, rule your heart, guide your feet in true righteousness and true holiness. Read it slowly, frequently, prayerfully, meditatively, searchingly, devotedly, and study it constantly, perseveringly, and industriously. Read it through and through until it becomes a part of your being and generates faith that will move mountains. The Bible is a mine of wealth, the source of health, and a world of pleasure. It is given to you in this life, will be opened at the judgment, and will stand forever. It involves the highest responsibility, will reward the least to the greatest of labor and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. It is the immutable word of the living God. And I pray that in this study, this study of the walk through the word, I pray it will light the spark that will become the flame that will turn into the burning inferno within you. And it will literally consume you and burn you and set you on fire 
for the living God with a desire and a hunger to serve Him and live for Him and walk with Him like you have never done it before. Through the Word of God. Amen. Amen. So let's go to the Word. Let's go to the Word. And let's begin our walk through the Word from Genesis to Revelation. And we are going to literally walk through the pages of every book of the Bible. And we are going to cover some fascinating things that you may have never heard before. We're going to to cover some things that are familiar with to you and that you've heard them all your life and you know them. But we're also going to cover some things that you haven't heard because I am learning so much myself in this study. And even though I've been an avid Bible student, a student of the Word for 23 years now, and I've taught the Word for 20 years, I tell you, I have never learned as much about the Word of God in any study that I have ever taught over these 20 years as I am learning in this study. Mm -hmm. And I know that you will also turn to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis. And we're also going to get into some Bible trivia. Those of you who like to learn just little, just little nuggets, just little facts that are not well known that you've always wondered about and you've always thought, what is the answer to that? We're going to get into some Bible trivia for those of you who like that. Now the book of Genesis, chapter 1. The word Genesis means origin, source, or begetting. B-E-G-E-T-T-I-N-G. The Jews called this book in the beginning. That is what the Jewish people call the book of Genesis. They refer to this book as with the title of In the Beginning. Why? Because that's the very first sentence in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, Genesis is the book of beginnings. Now chapter 1 of Genesis gives us the account of the creation of all things. It gives the account of God creating light, the sun, the moon, plants, trees, animals. But the crowning glory of God's creation was man. And what on what day of creation did God create man? Does anybody know? God created man on the sixth day, the number six. Anytime you, if you're in the Bible numerology, any numbers are so significant in the Word of God. And the number six refers to man. God created man on the sixth day. And what was this man's name? Adam. Adam, yes. And God made a garden for this man, and he placed this man in this garden. And what was the name of this garden? Eve. That's right. God made man. He made Adam, and he placed Adam in the garden of Eden. And Adam, we are told was made in the likeness and in the image of God. Look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, let us, who is he talking to? The Trinity, the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Did you know, ladies, that you have authority over the creeps? We just read it. 
We have authority over every creeping thing. So we have authority over creeps in the name of Jesus. <laughs> now, the, the man that Adam made was brilliant. He had a perfect mind. He named every living creature. God brought every animal from the largest dinosaur down to the most minute insect. God brought them to Adam to see what he, Adam, would name them. Yet of all of the animals that God made, there was not found one that was suitable to be Adam's helper. So God caused a deep sleep to come upon Adam. And he took one of Adam's ribs and made another human being. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 and 22, we have these facts. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he what? A woman. And brought her unto the man. Now, what did Adam call this creature, this created being that God created and brought unto Adam? Look at verse 23. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called what? Woman. Because she was taken out of man. Adam said, I'm going to call this created being woman. And later, what did Adam name this woman? Eve. Eve. That's right. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 20, look at what it says. And Adam called his wife's name Eve. Why? Because she was the mother of all living. Now, God didn't call them Adam and Eve. What did God call them? Adam. How do we know that? Genesis chapter 5, verse 2. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Why did God call them both Adam instead of calling Adam, Adam, and Eve, Eve, why did God call them both Adam? Because in God's eyes, the husband and the wife are one flesh. Look back at Genesis chapter 2. Let's read this again. In verses 23 and 24, let's look at it again. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now look at verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So God called them Adam. And in chapter 3, we have the account of the fall of man. Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And everybody blames Eve that Eve fell. But if you read what the Bible said, Adam was right there with her. He was there with her. Look at verse 6 of chapter 3. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree and a tree to be desired, to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Did you realize that Eve hadn't been created yet when God gave Adam the command that of every tree in the garden you shall freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat, for then the day that you eat, you will surely die. Mm -hmm. God spoke that to Adam. Eve had not been created yet, so Adam understood that. He was there. He heard God's voice speak to him clearly, but yet he was standing right there with Eve 
when she reached out and took that fruit and took a bite of that fruit and turned around and gave it to Adam and Adam ate it and he was the one that had heard God specifically give the command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So what happened after they ate? God cast them out of the garden. And in chapter 4, we find the account of Adam and Eve having two sons. And what was Adam and Eve's sons' names? Cain and Abel. Yes, very good. Now, the boys made an offering unto the Lord. And Abel brought an offering of animals, the firstlings of his flock. But Cain brought an offering of vegetables from his garden. And God accepted Abel's offering, but he rejected Cain's offering. And Marilyn Hickey says that that only goes to show you that you can't get blood out of a turnip. Because <laughs> God wanted a blood sacrifice mm -hmm. and Cain only brought <laughs> the sacrifice of the vegetables that he had grown in the garden. So Cain became angry and jealous of his brother Abel. And Cain rose up and killed Abel, his brother. And this is the first murder that ever occurred. And God pronounced judgment upon Cain and told him that he would be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And Cain went to live in the land of Nod, N-O-D, Nod. Now let's answer one of the most often asked questions about the Bible. And for those of you who like Bible trivia, listen up. I am sure that you have heard this asked over and over throughout the years. Where did Cain get his wife? Anybody ever been asked that question? A lot of people want to trick you up, and a lot of people want to trip you up and just confuse a Christian when they're trying to witness to them. So they'll ask off-the-wall questions like this, just out of the blue to try to, to stump you and get you off track. Where did Cain get his wife? Cain had children while he was in the land of Nod. And the question that people have asked over the years, that if Cain's parents were Adam and Eve, and we know they were, and they had two sons, Cain and Abel, and if Cain slew Abel, where did Cain get his wife? And some have written, and I have even read it in some books, that God created another race of people besides Adam and Eve. And the Cain married a woman from this other race of people. Not so. The Bible does not record this. It is not true because what did we just read? In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 20, look at it again. And Adam called his wife's name Eve. Why? Because she was the mother of all living. God did not create another race of people besides Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. So where did Cain get his wife anyway? Does anyone want to know? Are you interested in the answer? The Bible gives us the answer to this question. Let's read it. In Genesis chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, look at it. Read it carefully. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod. And by the way, the name Nod means wanderings. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, or wanderings, on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he builded a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. Now, it doesn't say that Cain married a wife when he went into the land of Nod. It says what? It says Cain knew, K-N-E-W, Cain knew his wife. 
And he knew his wife as a man would know his wife and she conceives a child. If Eve is the mother of all living, and we just read in Genesis 3.20 that Eve is the mother of all living, then she had to have had other children who were daughters. And in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 4, it verifies this fact. Let's look at it. Chapter 5, verse 4. In the days of Adam, after he had begotten Seth, were 800 years, and he begat what? Sons and daughters. The daughters are not named for us. And this is typical all through the Word of God because sons were always named in the Word, but very rarely does the Word of God ever mention the daughter's name or, or very few women's names are mentioned in the Bible. Why? Because in Bible days, in the Jewish culture, women were nothing more than property to be bought and sold, and they had little or no recognition at all. So Adam and Eve had other children because we know, we just read it, that Eve is the mother of all living. So God didn't create another race separate from Adam and Eve, and Cain didn't go over and marry someone of another race. No, Eve is the mother of all living. Eve had, Adam and Eve had other children, and some of them were daughters. Cain married his sister, and they had children while Cain lived in the land of Nod. Now, isn't that simple? The Bible is simple when you let Scripture interpret Scripture. That's why you can't pick out one little verse or a portion of a verse and base a doctrine or a theology on it. You have to take the whole counsel of the Word of God and read everything pertaining to the subject that you are questioning. So now you have the answer to one of the most frequently asked questions about the Bible. Now. Let's talk about something very important in chapter 5 of Genesis. We're going to talk about a man who was born to a man named Jared. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 18, And Jared lived a hundred and sixty and two years and begat Enoch. Now what is so significant about this man, Enoch? that was born unto a man called Jared. Who was Enoch? Something happened to Enoch that only happened to one other person in the entire Bible. Something happened, and there was only two people that it happened to. What was it? That's right. That's right. These two men were translated. They were transported from earth to heaven without ever having to taste of death. Who were these two men? Enoch and Elijah. They never died. Look at verse 24 of chapter 5. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Enoch had a, such a relationship and such a closeness to God. And he walked so near unto God the Father. And I believe one day as they were walking and communing together, God turned to Enoch and said, Enoch, we're closer to my house than we are to yours. Why don't you come on home and be with me? And he wow. walked with God and he was not because God took him. Where did he take him? To heaven to be with him. And now this is very important. In chapter 5 of Genesis, Enoch had a son. And what was this son's name? Does anybody know? Methuselah. And one of the meanings of the name Methuselah is at his death, judgment will come. Methuselah means at his death, judgment will come. And what is the significance about this man, Methuselah? Does anybody know? 
Very good. Methuselah was the oldest man who ever lived. How long did Methuselah live? Does anybody know? Yes, very good. The Word of God tells us this in Genesis chapter 5, verse 27. And all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. You know what? I believe that there was somebody, and it was probably Noah and his family that was praying that Methuselah would keep living. Why? Because at his death, judgment would come. And God in his sovereignty, God in his mercy, held off his judgment upon the earth. The earth had become so vile and so wicked that God said, I'm going to destroy the whole earth. But God in his mercy held back his hand of judgment until Methuselah died. And at his death, judgment would come upon the whole earth. In the year that Methuselah died, the flood came. And there was one man in all the earth. All men were evil, were wicked, except this one man and his family. And what was this man's name? Noah. Noah. In Genesis chapter 6, verses 8 and 9, but Noah found grace. And do you know what that word grace is in the Hebrew? It's one of the Hebrew favor. words for favor. favor. Noah found grace or favor in the eyes of the Lord. And these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect or wholehearted and mature in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And God told Noah to build an ark. And Noah and Mrs. Noah, their three sons and their sons' wives were saved. Out of all of the multiplied thousands upon thousands and even millions of people upon the earth, there were only eight people who were saved. And God sent a flood that destroyed the whole earth. It rained how many days? 40, 40 days and 40 nights. And God made a covenant with this man named Noah. And he, in this covenant, God made the promise that he would never destroy the earth again by water. And what was the token or the sign of this covenant that God made? Oh, y'all are good. I tell you, you are good Bible students. I am so proud of y'all. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 13 gives us the sign or the token of the covenant. It's called it. Scholars call it the Noahic covenant, the covenant that God made with Noah. And the sign or the token of this covenant is found in chapter 9, verse 13. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Now, what's the next significant thing in our walk? through the pages of the book of Genesis. It's found in Genesis chapter 11. And it's the Tower of Babel. B-A-B-E-L. The Tower of Babel. This is how all of the different languages originated. In the beginning, up until this point, every human being upon the face of the earth spoke the same language. If you went to another country, they spoke the same language as you did. Everybody spoke the same language. But this passage tells us the origin of all of the different languages that we have upon the earth. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 1, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Now look at verse 4. They all got together, all of the people got together, and they said, Let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven, and let us make us a name. Notice, I, we, let's, us, 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 cried, let's, us, man, we can do this 
confess ourselves. We don't need God. Let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now look at verse 6. And the Lord said, who's he talking to? His Son and the Holy Spirit. God said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they began to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So there you have the origin of all of the different languages that we have upon the earth. God confused their languages when they said, let's do this. We can do this in our own power, in our own ability. We don't need God. We'll do this ourselves. And God said, well, we'll just see about that, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Now the next important man in the book of Genesis is a man called Abram. A-B-R-A-M, Abram. God told this man, Abram, to leave his family and go with well. And in verse 1, Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will shew thee. I want you to notice that God spoke to him and said, Pack up everything you own. Take everything, your family, your herds, every earthly possession, and leave. And I'm not going to tell you where you're going. I'll show you as you go. What faith that yes. took for Abram to leave everything he knew, his family, everything he was familiar with, everything he had worked his whole life for, to leave it behind and set out and not know where he was going. That's like you putting everything that you can in your car, getting in your car, cranking it up, putting it in reverse and pulling it out of your driveway and not having any idea of where you were going. That would take some faith, wouldn't it? But that's exactly what Abram did. He left to go to another land and he did not know where he was going. Abram, in simple obedience to the word of, that the Lord had spoken unto him, left. And God directed Abram to go into the land of Canaan. And God promised to bless Abram and his seed, and that his seed, his descendants, would be as many as the sand of the sea, and as many as the stars in the heavens. But there was only one small problem. Sarah, his wife, was barren. She could not have children. And God changed Abram's name from Abram to Abraham. You know what the name Abraham means? Father of a great multitude. He changed Abram's name to Abraham long before Abraham ever had a son. Why? Because God's a God of faith. God always speaks things that be not as though they were and they become. They come into existence. And when Abraham was a hundred years old and Sarah, his wife, 90 years old, their son Isaac was born. In Genesis chapter 17. Wow. And verse 17. Genesis 17, 17. They were just a little bit amused, you could say, at the news when the announcement came that they would have a son. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed. Ha <laughs> ha, Abraham said, yeah, right, sure, I'm going to have a son. And he said in his heart, shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? Abraham said, yeah, right, ha ha ha, sure that's going to come to pass. But it did, because God had spoken it. And in Genesis chapter 22, we have the account that's one of the most often 
preach from passages in the Old Testament. It's the account of God speaking to Abraham to take his son, his only son, Isaac, and to offer Isaac upon the altar unto God. And this is a type. It is a picture, a type and shadow of God the Father offering his son Jesus upon the cross of Calvary. You know the story as Abraham tied his son upon that altar and as Abraham raised his knife to take the life of his son Isaac, and as he reached down and started to bring that knife down and thrust it into his son's heart, the angel of the Lord caught Abraham's hand. And there was a ram caught in the thicket. And Abraham offered that ram unto the Lord. And just like Isaac we were the ones that were supposed to die, but God offered His Son Jesus as our substitute. Right. We were the ones that should have been nailed to the cross for our sins. We should have died. We were the Son that should have died and gone to hell, but God the Father offered His Son Jesus as a substitute for our sins. Mm -hmm. Jesus died in our place just like that ram died as the sacrifice so Abraham's son Isaac could live. We should have died, but Jesus became our substitute mm -hmm. and He died in our That's place. Right. Mm -hmm. Now in Genesis chapter 24, uh, we've got to hurry or we're not going to get through the book of Genesis tonight. In chapter 24, we have the account of Abraham sending his servant to look for a wife for his son Isaac. And who did he choose? Does anybody know her name? Rebecca. And again, in the Word of God, this is a beautiful type and shadow of God the Father seeking a wife for his son Jesus. Mm -hmm. And who is his wife? We are. We are the bride of Christ, the church. Revelation 19, 7 tells us, For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Mm -hmm. We are the bride of Christ. We are the Lamb's wife. Mm -hmm. And in Genesis chapter 24, it's a beautiful picture, a type and shadow when Abraham sent his servant to seek a wife for his son Isaac, it's a beautiful picture of God the Father seeking a wife for his son Jesus. And in Genesis chapter 25, Isaac and Rebekah have twin boys. And what are their names? Does anybody know? Jacob and Esau. And Jacob's name means schemer or supplanter. And you know the story how Jacob tricked his brother Esau and stole his birthright. And then later on, Jacob tricked Esau again and stole his blessing. And Esau is so angry, he's going to kill his brother. And Jacob flees from Esau and he goes to live with Rebekah's brother. Does anybody remember his name? Laban. Laban. Jacob loves Laban's daughter, Rachel. And he works seven years in order to marry Rachel. And on their wedding night, Laban switches and gives him his other daughter, Leah, instead. So Jacob has to work another year, seven years, in order to marry Rachel. And in Genesis chapters 29 and 30, we have the account of 12 sons that were born unto Jacob. And these, this is the most significant family throughout the Bible in history. These 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel. These 12 sons became what is known as the patriarchs. The patriarchs. 
They are the 12 tribes of Israel, all of their descendants. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, who, who are the ones that we're most familiar with from our last study? Naphtali. Yes. All of the, these 12 sons of Jacob, they become the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. And then in Genesis chapter 31, Jacob and his wives and family leave the country where Laban lives and they go back to his homeland of Canaan. And of Jacob's 12 sons, one of them is his favorite. What's his name? Joseph. Joseph. Very good. Jacob <coughs> made him a coat of many colors. It was his birthright coat. And Joseph was loved by his father, but hated by his brothers. And in Genesis chapter 37, we have that account. Joseph's brothers wanted to kill him. But instead, they sold him into slavery. And then in the following chapters of Genesis, Genesis chapter 37 through 41, all these chapters gives us the account of Joseph, of go, him going from the pit to the prison to the palace of King Pharaoh in the land of Egypt. You remember the story. Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dreams of seven years of plenty and followed with seven years of famine. And as a result, Joseph was promoted to second in command to Pharaoh throughout all the land of Egypt. And the seven years of famine came just as Joseph said they would. And Joseph's father sent all of Joseph's brothers into the land of Egypt to buy bread. And Joseph immediately recognized his brothers. But after 13 years, his brothers did not recognize Joseph. And when Joseph told them who he was, they immediately became afraid that Joseph would kill them for what they had done to him. But Joseph forgave them and commanded them to bring his father, Jacob, and his whole family into Egypt. And in Genesis chapter 50, King Pharaoh gave Joseph and his family the best land in all of Egypt to live. And what is the name of of the place where they live? Does anybody know? Goshen. Goshen was the name of the city where the children of Israel live. And if you want a reference for that, it's Genesis chapter 47 and verse 6. Let me just read you that real quickly before we go to the last chapter in Genesis. Genesis 47, 6. The land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land, make thy father and brethren to dwell. In the land of Goshen, let them dwell. And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, or crafts, or skill, then make them rulers over my cattle. So the king of Egypt, King Pharaoh, gave Joseph and his father and his brothers and all of his family the best land in Egypt to live. And it was called the land of Goshen. And we will learn the importance and the significance of this city called Goshen when we study the book of Exodus next week. But I want you to look at Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. When Joseph's brothers came and when he told them who he was, his brothers were afraid and they were, were afraid that Joseph would kill them. But Joseph told them in Genesis chapter 50 verse 20, but as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. And we may not understand why we have to go 
through the problems and the trials we do in life, we may be thrown in the pit by our brothers, mm -hmm. by those who are supposed to love us. We may be sold into slavery in a foreign land. We may have bondages. We may have things in our life that we don't understand. We may be put in the prison. Oh, but God, in His mercy, will deliver us. He'll set us free because His loving kindness and His favor upon our lives, and He will promote us to the palace. Mm -hmm. We may go to the pit, we may have to go to the prison, but He will bring us into the palace. And we'll be able to say, just like Joseph, the enemy meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing in life, the enemy means it for evil. The enemy means to bring harm, but God will turn that situation around, whatever it is, and He'll bring good out of it. And you can say just like Joseph told his brothers, you meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. Right. And He sent me here to preserve life. You can share the goodness of God and God's deliverance and what He's done for you and minister to others and help set others free. Mm -hmm. yes. God will use you. 